I'm Skip Airy, N2EI of Southern New Jersey. If you're interested in radio, AM, FM, shortwave, amateur radio, pirate broadcasting, and more, you won't want to miss the International Radio Report every Sunday morning at 10.30 on CKUT, 90.3 FM in Montreal, and online at CKUT.ca. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. It is Sunday, November the 12th, 2023. My name's Sheldon. I am with Jill here today, as usual. And we have our 30 minutes of news and information for you from the world of radio. We thank you for tuning in. You can reach us by email, radioreport at yahoo.com. Our show is live streaming also archived at ckut.ca. Our Facebook group, International Radio Report, 945 members. We welcome Paul in the UK joining us this week. Uh, You can join the uh, group easily. Just go to the Facebook page, International Radio Report, and click Join, and uh, you can participate in the group. Our YouTube channel gives you the opportunity to listen to our programs at your convenience. Uh, Look for us uh, at IRR or just do a search for International Radio Report on YouTube. And we're just under the 900 subscriber there, 898 subscribers. If you haven't subscribed yet, uh, please consider doing that. And our X account at IRR. CKUT. A few more followers coming on board. We're up to 36 now, so it's gradually picking up as we move along. So uh, lots of ways to listen to our show um, live or at your convenience and participate through our Facebook group and X account. So we'll get to a lot of stories here today, uh, some from around here and some from around the world. Uh, Gilles, you'll get things started off with something going on in the French radio scene here in Montreal. A um, very well-known radio personality here in Quebec, Paul Arcan, that is on one of the top stations on the francophone side of radio, 98.5 FM, is actually not on the air since uh, something like Wednesday. Uh, What happened is that he didn't feel well and he went to see the doctor as um, he got what is a very sudden and quick illness. It, it seems to be quite important because he uh, went to see the doctor and didn't come back on the air the next day. So he, what he's saying in um, the comments that he left is that uh, being a man, he didn't take care of himself maybe as he should and you know see some of the signs when he started getting a little tired, take care of himself and eventually come back on the radio. They don't say what illness, uh, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but keeping it quiet, and he actually even asks for, um, you know, to keep their privacy. He's um, going to be off for a undetermined amount of time, and, of course, he's uh, already going to retire from 98.5 in June of next year, I believe, uh, replaced by Patrick Lagasse. But he did say that uh, he will come back before the end, so... Hopefully, it's not too serious and that uh, he'll get back uh, in good health. Yeah, certainly one of the most uh, well-known and popular voices on uh, French radio in Quebec here. So uh, we wish him well. And uh, we thank uh, our regular listener and contributor, uh, Normand Martel, for uh, passing stories along about uh, Paul Arcao. Uh, next, we have um, an, an opinion piece uh, that um, was uh, put together and appeared in Broadcast Dialogue. It's a, a media magazine here in Canada. Uh, we covered the story a couple weeks ago now, I guess, about the uh, Ottawa radio station, campus station at the University of Ottawa that uh, lost in a referendum of the students uh, to supply them with funding from their tuition fees. Barry Rook has written uh, this article for Broadcast Dialogue, and it's an op-ed piece. Defunding of CHUOFM underscores fragility of media landscape, uh, says the NCRA, which is the National Campus and Community Radio Association. And uh, the uh, op-ed piece is actually signed by the NCRA, Board of Directors and staff, and it reads as follows. 
we at the National Campus and Community Radio Association are deeply disheartened by the recent developments surrounding CHUOFM, in which 7.7% of the undergraduate student body decided to withdraw their support for Canada's first bilingual licensed independent radio station. This follows a hastily arranged defunding campaign motivated by a single member of the University of Ottawa Student Union Board. This incident underscores the fragile state of our current media and news landscape. Campus radio stations have always been pivotal in de delivering news information and programming tailored specifically for on-campus and off-campus audiences. Since 1975, CHUOFM has played a unique role in the community of providing bilingual programming and content for underrepresented communities. These stations stand as symbols of a local voice, championing regional stories and connecting communities in ways mainstream channels often cannot. They have been a beacon of diversity, ensuring that voices from all backgrounds are heard, celebrated and recognized. With widespread reduction in access to reliable news, exacerbated by recent actions like Meta's blocking of not-for-profit stations on social media, the value of local information is under siege from multiple directions. We stand in solidarity with CHUO and all community and campus radio stations. We urge stakeholders, students, and communities to recognize and support the significant contributions of these institutions. The defunding of even one station is a blow to the rich tapestry of local content that binds our communities. In these challenging times, let us be reminded of the power and necessity of local news and the role campus stations play in preserving and amplifying it. Let us unite to strengthen, not weaken, the platforms that genuinely give voice to the voiceless. Again, that's from the uh, National Campus and Community Radio Association Board of Directors and Staff. And uh, this kind of hits close to home here yep. at uh, CKUT, uh, w which is also a campus community station and does rely on funding, a good part of its funding, from student fees each year. And uh, the same thing happens here. Uh, referendums are held at McGill University to determine whether the student body wants to contribute a portion of their uh, tuition fees to the running of the campus community radio station. But uh, this is something that I'm sure the staff here at the station will be keeping a close watch on. You know, it's very important to keep on uh, these, these stations on, on the air because um, it's the only way we get different types of programming. I mean, the mainstream radio stations, they're all boring, all doing the same thing, and there's no diversity, and there's no, you know, they're not going out there and, and asking if, you know, some communities want to have their show, or the only stations that do so is either campus community radio and community radio in general. So it's very important to explain that and defend the fact that these have to stay on the air. Our, our show is a perfect example, and we've mentioned it many times. Uh, our show would not be heard on any regular commercial radio station. Nope. Um, it's just taboo on a commercial station to have a show like this that is talking about people having the opportunity to listen to other radio stations than the one you're currently listening to. That's just something that doesn't happen. Uh, hmm. But it does happen at stations uh, like campus and, and campus community radio stations. In our next uh, story, we have uh, car makers that say solving analog AM interference in electric vehicles could cost billions. This is by Randy J. Stein of Radio World. A report from the Center for Automotive Research says fixing the technical issues facing AM radio reception and electric vehicles will come with a huge price tag. A car study released in October states that electromagnetic interference mitigation through the shielding and filtering in the new electric vehicles could cost car makers $3.8 billion over the next seven years. One automaker told car that shielding would cost 35 to 50 dollars and filtering would add 15 to 20 dollars per vehicle 
This is a finding at odds with perceptions among U.S. broadcasters that limiting or eliminating such issues is not a serious challenge, at least for some car makers. According to a graph provided by CAR and the technical report, the $3.8 billion estimate of costs are shared across multiple electric modules within EVs that require EMI mitigation, which critics of the report say makes it difficult to put an exact cost on mitigation for analog AM radio. Shielding cables, interference filters, active noise cancellation, physical placement of components, and vehicle redesigns are among the options to reduce EMI interference with analog AM, but those options come with a cost and add weight to the vehicle that will reduce its range. Some automakers have discontinued or plan to discontinue AM radio in electric vehicles. The center's research study says there are multitudes of ways EV owners can receive audio products, echoing recent public statements by the auto industry. These include FM, satellite, Bluetooth, and phone connectivity, allowing consumers to curate their in-car audio experience. Additionally, AM radio content can be accessed through the digital AM radio if the broadcast is available, which has less noise and includes more text information for the user interface, or in-car streaming services stream AM station content. The organization says modern vehicles of all kinds have complex onboard electronics system controlling everything from brakes and adaptive driver assistance to infotainment and safety, all of which can generate EMI and distort AM signals. Specifically, EVs bring new noise sources stemming from the electromotive nature of their propulsion system, the report states. The nature of EVs and their operating conditions pose a challenge to ensure electromagnetic compatibility with the analog AM radio band. The most effective methods to mitigate AM interference would need to be engineered into new vehicle designs, it said. A total vehicle system EMC requirement would need to be included from the beginning of any future EV redesign, if not already considered by the automakers to eliminate the need for piecemeal late-stage mitigation. Those costs can be avoided by deleting analog AM radio from vehicles and providing consumers with alternative products for in-vehicle audio content, according to the study. Congress is still considering bills that would require analog AM radio in all new vehicles. The AM for Every Vehicle Act would direct the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to issue a rule that requires automakers to maintain AM broadcast radio in their vehicles without a separate or additional payment fee or surcharge. Supporters of keeping AM radio in new vehicles often point to its importance for public warnings when it comes to an emergency. However, John Bozella, president and CEO of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, says the nationwide tests of EAS and WEA in October proved otherwise. In an online blog post Monday making note that the car study, he also cited the survey from the Consumer Technology Association that showed 95% of adults received the alert on a phone, 15% on TV, 5% on FM radio, and 1% via AM radio. So they are definitely trying to tell us that it would cost a lot of money, that it would be complicated, and that they're even trying to tell us that nobody's listening to AM radio, basically. Many interesting numbers and, and statistics and costs involved in, in, in putting an AM a listenable radio into electronic cars. So we shall see. Uh, 3.8 billion? I don't know. Mm. And uh, the what what the Congress is talking about, and, and if they put that rule, that act into effect, uh, they're saying that the price of making these modifications should not be passed on to the consumer. No. Well, I think we can be pretty sure that that's not going to happen. No. Uh, they'll build it right into the cost of that car. Oh, for sure. Uh, no doubt. For sure. So, you know, I think all of them complaining about it and the cost and all of that is going to have more people wondering, well, gee, you know, this is interesting. Why are we, what's the big deal here? And they're going to start maybe looking at AM and saying, oh, yeah, okay, well, yeah, I really do need this, hmm. but 
uh, you know, we shouldn't have to pay for it. Yeah. They're basically taking something away from us that we already had. Yeah. And, and now they're going to want to charge us to give it back to us. Uh, not the way things are supposed to work. This is an interesting one. It comes from an interesting source, too. If you're interested in talk radio, uh, there's a neat website called talkers.com. And it's all about talk radio and things going on in the world of talk radio and programming and what have you. And this week they had a new story. Uh, Odyssey, which owns a whole bunch of radio stations in the United States, unveils a new town hall program across all news radio stations. Odyssey announced a new quarterly town hall program called Odyssey Con Conversations. It involves 12 of its all news formatted radio stations company says, quote, the quarterly program will feature a robust week of coordinated local coverage in Odyssey's news markets, a live town hall broadcast rotationally hosted by one of its brands and a syndicated news special heard across participating news and news talk brands and nationwide via the Odyssey app. Odyssey VP of News, Bill Smee, commented, Odyssey Conversations aims to foster meaningful conversations on vital topics, exemplifying the core of Odyssey's news platform and radio's unwavering commitment to informing and connecting the local communities we serve. We look forward to leveraging the power and influence of our combined news brands to cultivate conversations and connections on topics relevant to our local communities throughout the year. The next Odyssey Conversations explores the state of downtown. It says over three years later, America's cities are still grappling with challenges and unexpected fallout caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. WBBM News Radio and uh, WFCFSFM in Chicago will host a live town hall on November the 9th uh, to explore those impacts in depth and what at, what's at stake for businesses and community members as cities look to revitalize their downtowns. And to give you an idea of where this program will air, the program will air on WBBM, which is in Chicago, uh, KRLD News Radio 1080 in Dallas, WWJ in Detroit. We've got KYW News Radio in Philly, KB CBS, which is out in San Francisco. Uh, they're, they're going to air it on the 16th of November uh, at 7 p.m. local time. It'll be on WBEN AM in Buffalo, WCCO AM in Minneapolis, WWL in New Orleans, KDKA in Pittsburgh, and KMOX in St. Louis. Throughout the week of November 13th to 17th, the all news stations will air special content catered to the town hall topics, including interviews, news stories, and feature reporting. So this is a neat initiative, I think, of Odyssey, yep. looking at subjects that affect widespread audience in, in, in cities where they have radio stations. So it's kind of like syndication. But it'll be a program that will accept input from from men, you know any of the different stations with a different station hosting the subject uh, on each different program. So uh, a pretty neat uh, undertaking by Odyssey. So if you have one of those stations uh, that you can hear, and many of those are clear channels, so you might be able to hear them from you know even if you're not in those cities. Uh, and gee, how many of them are on AM? So <laughs> don't be listening in your car, your electric car, because you might get some interference and not hear the program <laughs> this is good because in a kind of an era of moving to general radio that is not personalized anymore and it's kind of cold uh, at least now they're you know doing something that um to join all of these people to have them you know uh, participate and and see an impact for everyone so this is what radio should always be actually this reminds me of uh, CBC's program on the weekend, Cross Canada Checkup, where they open the phone lines all across Canada. They pick a topic to talk about, and people can phone in from anywhere across the country. So I think it's a similar type of, uh, of operation like that. And that's a show that's very popular here in Canada, right across the country. So what's happening with our son? Well, the son was quite active. We had uh, quite a few... Uh, coronal mass ejections and uh, a couple of flares this week. But what really was the center of attention all week was the uh, several 
uh, geomagnetic storms that we actually had, and that, uh, including the one on um, last Sunday, a pretty intense one too. There is, of course, still some uh, storm watch uh, in case something happens. So keep an eye out for that possibility of having uh, auroras. So if your favorite station is not there, it could be because of that. Um, the sunspot number is 93, the solar flux 139, but uh, you need to have a radio that's turned on to actually witness all of this activity. This is Christopher Lobdell of Tuxbury, Massachusetts. Listen to the International Radio Report every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. So in our next story, we have, uh, this is a good story, actually. The BBC's emergency Gaza radio broadcasts show why world service mustn't rely on digital technology. This is the Middle East North Africa Financial Network via Radio Info Asia. The radio service in Arabic began on November 3rd with additional programming that began on November 10th. Why would people in Gaza want to listen to the BBC? Partly because the BBC's reputation for providing trustworthy news for a global audience. Reuters Institute research suggests that the BBC remains the most trusted news source in the UK itself and that in the US, the BBC is trusted more than any domestic national media network. But this analysis does not extend to cover the views of audiences in the Middle East. Probably more important is the desire for news and information after disruption to local radio services after transmitters were destroyed through targeted strikes or collateral damage Digital information services are also liable to shutdowns due to damage and the strategic closing of the internet and phone networks by the Israeli military. The BBC's Dues Arabic television service is also vulnerable to these threats. Information blockades are a big part of the information war that is currently being waged. The BBC has turned to old-fashioned medium wave as the best means to provide civilians in Gaza with news and information. All that is required to listen is a cheap analog radio set. These can be battery-powered and operate even without mains electricity, another crucial consideration in a war zone in which many people have been displaced. This method of delivering radio is therefore much more resilient than digital audio broadcasts. Communications infrastructure has been damaged by bombing in Gaza, making it difficult for residents to access news and information. Traditionally, international broadcasters such as BBC have used shortwave radio to reach listeners. The BBC reactivated its historic Cold War shortwave radio services to Russia and Ukraine in 2022 to overcome wartime disruption and Russian restrictions placed on digital content. Establishing a pop-up service for listeners in Sudan in early 2023, as that country uh, tethered on the edge of civil war. The BBC used shortwave as well as digital and social media platforms. However, shortwave listeners need more specialist radio sets. These are probably harder to come by in Gaza. Since the beginning of the Cold War, the BBC has often secured time on local medium wave transmitters to relay its programs to distant audiences, a crucial way of supplementing shortwave services. The return to medium wave underlines the dangers of the recent move by many international broadcasters away from radio and towards digital platforms. The internet is a great way to reach audiences in peacetime or those living in places where the state and the military are not attempting to restrict internet access and content. But in times of crisis, digital connections are easily severed. Analog radio is not an obsolete technology. The BBC's commitment to broadcasting in Arabic stretches back some 85 years. It launched a shortwave BBC Arabic service as early as 1938. 
This was the first time ever regular BBC foreign language radio service established to counter anti-British propaganda broadcast in Arabic from Mussolini's Italy. The uh, BBC Arabic service was conceived of as a tool of persuasion, subtly serving British foreign policy interests. During and after the Second World War, it played a crucial role in presenting news and comment on international affairs from a British perspective to listeners across the Middle East. The BBC Arabic service survived until January 2023. It was then closed down in the face of severe government-imposed restrictions on BBC revenues. Unpredictable top-up grants from the government have kept some BBC foreign language services going on digital platforms, but radio services for international listeners, not just those in the Middle East, have been dramatically pruned. As this now looks extremely short-sighted, a self-inflicted diminution of British overseas influence, resulting from the more general hostility of the conservative government and its supporters towards the BBC. Why does the BBC need to establish emergency stations for listeners in Sudan and Gaza at short notice? Because its peacetime ability to broadcast in Arabic and in other languages has been drastically reduced. The Gaza radio service may not be a triumph for British soft power, but rather a sign of the hollowing out of the BBC's capacity to speak to the world on Britain's behalf. Indeed, um, it is really uh, short-sighted to think about uh, the fact that you go all digital and everybody's going to follow. It doesn't work like that. There was internet shutdown this week and uh, phones weren't working. The only thing that goes through when that happens is what? Radio. Seeing what we've seen of what Gaza looks like, I think it's pretty safe to say that, uh, you know, computers are not easily accessible. Internet services are not probably running, even cellular services. You know, if, if infrastructure is damaged as much as it looks to have been, good old fashioned radio is going to come through. And uh, even the smallest little inexpensive portable is going to give people access to it. BBC decided to use uh, some sites um, along the Mediterranean to get those programs out that would carry uh, the distance on on AM. So uh, even though their shortwave uh, to that area has been uh, diminished greatly, uh, Mm -hmm. they found ways to get programming in. So that's really good to see. And I, I think it maybe will make some politicians and some governments think twice about uh, cutting things off that uh, can be very, very important for uh, for people in, in times like, like what's going on now. Yep. So we have upcoming ham radio contests. Coming up next weekend for uh, the ham bands, we have first uh, the LZDX contest. It is organized by the a Bulgarian Federation of Radio Amateurs, 1200 Zulu, November 18th to 1200 Zulu, November 19th. It's 80 through 10 meters, and it's both SSB and CW. There's the All Austrian 160 meter contest, 1600 Zulu to 2359 Zulu, November 18th, organized by the Austrian Experimental Transmitter Association, 160 meters and CW only. And finally, the ARRL Sweepstakes Contest, SSB, organized by the American Radio Relay League. It runs 2100 Zulu, November 18th to 0300 Zulu, November 20th. This one is to support amateur radio self-training in radio communications, including improving amateur operating skills, something that's desperately needed if you've listened to the ham bands recently. Uh, conducting technical investigations and intercommunicating with other amateurs. Stations in the U.S. and Canada, including territories and possessions, will exchange information with as many other U.S. and Canadian stations as possible. It's all the major bands, 160 through 10 meters, and it is an SSB phone event. And we are out of time. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any comments on any of the stories or questions for us, uh, 
feel free to email us radio report at yahoo.com or you can post messages up on our facebook group international radio report we thank you for tuning in we hope you'll do so again next week here on ckut fm 90.3 in montreal and on the web ckut.ca we are here in the city of montreal every week at this time with the international radio report have a great week everybody bye bye